my normal persona in my living history, living archaeology, is sort of mid 1700s, early to mid 1700s. But today, I'm fast forwarding 100 years to uh, 1816. And the War of 1812 is just freshly over and vivid in most people's minds. And, and we're in Nova Scotia, province of Nova Scotia. And Lord Dalhousie, the governor of Nova Scotia, he's, he's keenly interested in agriculture. So, uh, and also he's, because of the war, he's looking at defense of both Halifax and the Annapolis Royal area. So he, he wants a road built ultimately that join the two for commerce, for trade, uh, for, and, and for defense. So he convinces a Lieutenant William Ross, uh, who at the time uh, being a Lieutenant, there's some confusion over his actual rank. A, 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 a Lieutenant couldn't be issued a land grant, but a Captain could. So William Ross, he's born in Cork, Ireland. He's served in, in the different wars and he's, he's, but he is a Lieutenant of the 16th uh, Infantry uh, in, in Nova Scotia. So I think his Dalhousie makes gives him the rank of captain, and and he convinces Ross to lead a group of 172 disbanded military men into the hinterland or wilderness of the middle part of Nova Scotia, and it's and, and to make a settlement for agriculture. Well, it's horrible ground. It, it's tough going, but he issues rations. So. Uh, Mary um, and and William they head off with this 172 men. Now each man is given a ration of uh, one axe, uh, one shovel, and I believe one hoe. And then for every five men, they're given an auger, a draw knife, uh, and a few other tools. And they're given seed for seed potatoes, um, turnip seed, uh, white and red clover, and they have to build this community uh, community out of nothing in in the wilderness. And so we are actually have the privilege of being at the Ross Farm today. We're going to be given a tour by uh, by the uh, operations manager Barry Hiltz, and we're we're really looking forward to that. But what what takes place at Ross Farm is because these rations included rum, and I'm not sure this is the main factor. I think primarily it was a tough way to make a living, and they were trying to hew this life out of this wilderness. But after two years, the rations, the food rations were cut off, and the rum rations were cut off. And enough of these disbanded soldiers had dead simply enough. They, they didn't sign up for this kind of farm, and most of them left. But the people that stayed, um, they developed a real strong relationship with the land in this area, and they're here to this very day. Their ancestors settled here, and uh, there's some pretty common names in and around New Ross, and, and they're probably going to be here for another 200 years. Anyway, I'm going to go off and we're going to meet up with Barry Hiltz, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this tour. There he is, Barry Hiltz. How are you? I've been told by my wife it's been 15 years. Is that right? Yep. It's been a while. You haven't aged today. You haven't aged today. <laughs> Thanks. So we're we're here at the Ross Farm Museum, and uh, and what's your role here, Barry? I am site manager. Site manager, yep. and we're going to get a private tour. And private tour. A, a pretty amazing, amazing facility. And how long you worked here, Barry? I think this is my 42nd year. I think. Wow. <laughs> Start when I was really young. And what year did the museum open? It opened in 1970. 1970. And I started in '79. Must be getting close to retirement. I hope. I tell you, there's a lot of you around driving up here. Every second mailbox has got hilts on it. Hell yeah, there's a lot uh, of us. There's yeah. a lot of you. Well, yeah. You maybe go back to the actual Captain Ross days. Perhaps. We go back quite a ways. I'm not sure how far. I haven't. I live history. I don't really research it a lot yeah, unless it's go. something I need. <laughs> so this, where we're standing right now, this is actually the original Captain Ross's. Uh, house. Yes, this is. Uh, we're quite fortunate because we have the buildings right in this farm area are all original, and all are on the original foundations. That's so, crazy. this was built. This was started in 1816, and the summer kitchen part here was added on about 100 years later. So it's 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 an interesting old house. So his original. Um, doing a little research myself. When Captain Ross first comes here, he's down. This is Lake Lawson down here. That is, yeah. So that would have been somewhere down there. Would have been his first somewhere. Or yeah, there's cabin of some supposed sort. to be a pole hut somewhere down in this area. And then they started this one the same year. Finished it the following year. 
Supposedly, yeah. So we get to go inside? We do. All right. Looking forward to it. Oh my. Lovely. Just lovely. Look at this. So a lot of what I'm looking at in here as far as accoutrements are, are actual period pieces. Yes. Yeah. That looks like a um, an actual original brown bass. It is. Which would have been carried by the group of men that came here. They were War of 1812 was just shortly over when they came here. Exactly, right? yeah. Yeah. And we have a Virgin Tower musket over here. Oh, yeah. By golly. So we're looking at into the uh, boat 21. So it wouldn't have been here very long. That would no. have been that would have been state of the art technology, would, yeah. right? That's right. Not too many would have owned a gun with a with a flintlock or a percussion action on it. So Captain Ross, when he um, when they built this ferry, they um, I understand that he. Uh, He's in the process of building a road, is that correct? Blazing yes. a road to Halifax? He was uh, he was surveying and blazing a road. I think too, uh, what I've researched showed that Dalhousie, the governor at the time, he was also very interested in agriculture and he wanted to promote that. He wanted interior settlements, yes. but he, it was also a defense thing. He wanted a road from from uh, Port Royal to Halifax. Was, yeah. uh, I mean, the War of 1812 was pretty vivid in their minds in 1816. That's right. That's right. So, so this would have been the kitchen. Right? This would have been the kitchen, yeah. And uh, pantry next room here. Pantry in here. Okay. And dining room here, and then living room and strangers' quarters. Strangers' quarters. Yeah. What for visitors. Strangers? Oh, for visitors. And they call it strangers' quarters. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, I've had a few strangers stay at my place too, <laughs> or strange people, types. People, but... <laughs> people traveling through through the area, you're always welcome to come. Yeah, and times stay. are different then, eh? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, this upstairs is all pretty much original. I mean, we got the hand hued beams that are all original. Wow. So it literally is, uh, I mean, I have a real passion for history. This is literally stepping back in time. Yes, it is. Yeah. Pretty basic uh, accoutrements, furniture and such, eh? That's right. Just the bare bones. Bare bones, nothing too fancy. So you're telling me about something interesting upstairs here. Follow me. It's back in here. So what am I looking at here, Barry? Well, all along the top of this wall here, on that plate is clay that the the builders 200 years ago shoved in to keep the draft down, and you can see fingerprints into it in isn't, places. Isn't that crazy? Well, that's a bit of history right there. Well, thanks for showing that, Barry. So here we are in the workshop, Barry, and what year was this one built? This was built in 1870. This is one of the original buildings on the original foundation. Well, and uh, I tell you, I've got some tool envy happening right now. Yeah, we well, got quite a selection. These weren't all the tools. These tools weren't all at the museum when it was taken over. These are tools that would have been in that time period. Right, so over here we have some of your some of your wares, I guess. Yeah, we do. We we put on a demonstration every year of snowshoe making and toboggan making also. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the forms that we have and some of the uh, rawhide snowshoes. So and you're also looking over here. You've got uh, ox uh, yokes you're making. Yes, we are. This is a. a practice piece somebody was making quite often what they do we use a head yoke which actually is strapped the yoke is strapped to the horns it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't set on the back of the head it this this should be enough room under here that you can you can put a pencil under between okay. this head and, and the butt and the yoke okay so the only part that's hitting is right here on the yoke and then it's strapped it's a it's a german uh 
stall yoke. Uh, the French used it before they were deported, and then when they came back, they used boat yokes, from what I can understand. Probably a lot more humane way to have the animal pull, I would think. It's It's been a great debate. Yeah? Yeah, it's been a great you debate. Know, we, we're going to go down and see your... Cooperage yes. building, but that was actually moved on site. Is, is this the building that was moved by the ox? That was the Cooperage was. It was the Cooperage set out to the right of this building, and we moved it 1,600 feet with ten teams of oxen, and the building's about eight, eight or ten ton. Wow, that would have been something to see. It, yeah, it was. It was. It, it, a lot of people came to watch it. Yeah, I'll bet. and it was one of those unknowns. We knew they did it, but there wasn't anybody around that could help us. Yeah. You know, their parents, I heard their father saying that they moved buildings, and they did. There's houses that's been moved around the community here by Oxen, you know, 100 years ago. So we said, well, we must gonna, be able to do it. Must be able to do it. We're going to try. Okay. Yeah. Just before we go, I got I admire this. Uh, can I try your little shaving horse? You can so. Because I build shaving horses. Kind of a passion for these, and it's my favorite tool. This, this is, I, I agree with you 100%, Beard. This bench and a draw knife, you want a draw knife to go with it? You can do a whole lot of stuff. Is used the most of any tool in this workshop. When I started here over 40 years ago, we made a lot of buckets, butter churns, perkins, piggins, and we use this type of locking system, which is called a arrowhead lock. Well, look at that. You never seen the like. And I shaved hundreds of these onto that bench. That's why the insert is there because I needed a surface that was very flat because this, in order to fit the taper of a vessel, your hoop has to be tapered. So it's an eighth of an inch wide on the top, tapered to a sixteenth on the bottom. So it'll fit that taper. So it fits outwards. the taper of it. So I had to cut those, I would split it shave it out of green wood and then bend it, cut the cut the arrowheads into it and bend it. I've just started a new birch bark canoe, Barry. Maybe if you're in Ontario, you could come out and have, help me out. Love to. <laughs> so show me how you're going to place that. Uh, so with, once you get it around. Once, once you get it, what you do is you cut your eye in first and put this little shoulder. It looks just like an arrowhead. Yeah. So that shoulder determines the length against these two ears. Yes. What holds the hoop is these ends. Before you get enough pressure on to break this, you get enough pressure on these two ends against the main body of the hoop. So to put them together, you, you got to turn it, put it in, and twist it. And then you got the friction of those two tails. And those two tails being jammed against the main body of the hoop hold, will hold, hold it. I've had them, I've yeah. had them split here before. And I said, well, that's not, you know, that's, that's not going to work. So I'll, I demonstrated to people how much pressure this would make. And most of the time, this hoop was completely tore apart before that would ever let go. So we've got the actual yoke in, uh, in practice here, Barry. That's in right. Use, I should say. So you so. can see that it's, it's uh, cut out for the horn to fit into it. And it's wrapped. What do you get? Three wraps. Three wraps around. And it also comes across the forehead and then wrapped around again. So that ox is, is what he's doing is he's, he's pushing against the straps, mm -hmm. which pulls, pulls his load pulls along. Load. This is a traditional size or style yoke. These cattle are also shod. They have shoes on them. And we're going to see that in the blacksmith shop. Blacksmith shop, we'll see the shoes. One yeah. of the objectives of the Ross Farm has been to sort of bring back the heritage breeds, and and, and you're attempting to do that with the oxen as that's, well. That's true, yeah. we Prior to the late 80s, we would bring animals in from the community. We'd bring in Percheron or, or whatever breed of cattle or horses. We had oxen from around the community, and we'd have sheep. Uh, different breeds. So in the late 80s, they decided that we would use not only period machinery, but would use period animals. So we done research, see what animals would have been available at that time. And so we got the Canadian horse, the, uh, the Cotswold and Southdown sheep, the uh, Berkshire pigs, and our cattle is a mixture because when they use 
Traditionally, the head yoke was used, and traditionally, they would cross their animals to get a breed that was suitable so they could have had Ayrshire in them, they could have had whatever. But Lots of variety. I'm sure there was a Canadian in them too. We need horns. We need a breed that has good horns mm -hmm. and some legs under them. Yeah. Because if you're walking from here to Chester with a load of barrels, you want that team to keep up with you. Yeah. And the interesting part about Ross Farm is not just a facade. What we have here is a working farm. Like cows have to be milked. That's right. Sheep have to be sheared. Yep. Uh, horses have to be trained. So. And, and you were talking about breeds of cows at the time, so what, what are we looking at here, Barry? What we're looking at is a cross between purebred Canadian bulls and the cows are a cross between uh, Hereford, as you can see in this girl. Mm -hmm. The Hereford Brocco face is, like she's probably been at least three generations removed from the Hereford. And that face keeps showing up in every breed, in the brindle. It <laughs> can't get rid of it. Can't get rid of it. Brindle brown. And this one is a, a Durham yeah. cross. So she's probably old, well over three-quarter Canadian, but she still shows the Durham. So it's, you know, some of those, some of those genes are very strong and they just keep they just keep coming. What breed are we looking at? These are Berkshire. So again, a heritage breed. A very old breed, Breakfast. Yeah, get up under there, little fella. That's why we have these wooden rails around. Because you know, some days are graceful. Now she looks like she might be a little graceful. And sometimes they just sometimes flop. they just flop. Yeah, if you get one of these little ones underneath, kill them. Oh, stop them right in. Oh, stop them right in. Oh, so she's she's getting enough time to get away. She's very careful. Very careful. Yeah. Supper growing up on the farm. <laughs> That's what our kitchen table looked like. You had a long arm and you had to be quick. Yeah. You get a at the table, you left out. What, what do we have here, Barry? These are the Seanaclair chickens. They were developed in Quebec around the early 1900s, around 1920, they were recognized. They were developed by a, a, a monk in Oka, Quebec. And he was in charge of the chickens at the monastery, and he realized that taking care of all the chickens in wintertime in Quebec, a lot of the breeds didn't do so well. So he decided that he was going to develop a chicken breed for the Quebec winters. So this is one of the breeds that there's actually a recipe on how he bred them. So really? He, he took different breeds, and he took the rooster from this and bred it with a hen from here. So what he wanted is he wanted a chicken that didn't have any comb or wattles. So that wasn't a, a problem in the wintertime, freezing. Freeze. So when he gets a drink, his wattles don't go in the water and his comb doesn't freeze. He wanted a dual purpose, both eggs and meat. He wanted a yellow skin, white feather chicken, because that's what we eat in North America. Mm -hmm. And with white feathers, when you pluck them, if you have a pen feather, it's not as noticeable. Mm -hmm. As other colors would be. Well, you got you got everything you wanted right there. So I'm thinking, Barry, our our persona that Kathy and I portray is mid early to mid 1700s, and your farm covers what period? Early 1800s to the early 1900s. So, so essentially a hundred years difference yeah. in what we try to do um, and what's being done on the farm and even the attire. So I'm wearing what would have been typical attire of 1750 and you're wearing typical attire of 1850. So yeah. things right. change, but the people in 1750 would have killed for some of this machinery. This is state of the art to them. 
It is, yeah. Once once there was factories that could do castings and steel was readily available, then this machinery just started popping up everywhere. So what are we looking at? What's this machine here? Do? This this whole building is a stave and shingle mill, and there were hundreds of these around. They were set up to make barrel stock. All the parts of a barrel was made in here. And then they added shingles. And the, the only it's kind of interesting because this is a this is called a heading saw, so it, it works on a pendulum. So this is the carriage that you put a big block of wood in, you jam it in here, right? Mm -hmm. You throw it in gear, and this swings into the saw, and out comes a slab of wood, and then you put the slab of wood up there and you join it. Well, to switch this over to making shingles, you switch these two cogs here. And you put ones on, you put two of them on that are like this. So what happens every time that comes back, it ratchets the head. It moves it over. It goes to one, the long one on this time, and then the next time it goes to the short one. Oh, there you go. So your block of wood is keeping going like this and sawing shingles. You're getting that thick end and thick the end, thin, thin end. end. Thick yep. end, thin that's, end. That's the only thing you got to switch on this machine. Amazing technology, eh? Wow. And we've got a number of other machines in here I'm quite curious about. So what do we have over here? It's rather sophisticated, Barry. This is a stave saw. This is what saws the barrel staves. And you have a, a drum saw. It's like a giant hole saw with the teeth on the edge. So you take one of these logs and you lay it on the carriage and you feed it into these spinning blade and it saws a stave. And when you pull the carriage back, your stave should come out. But this one didn't. So that's that's what it would saw. So it has the, the has curve already it. into it. Yeah. yeah. And the barrels you're making, they're um, they're dry barrels. They are. They're a dry barrel used for mostly for apples. From the Annapolis Royal area, that's where a lot of the apples were all grown. Yeah, all through the Annapolis Valley, millions of barrels of apples went out over the years. So when you replicated the trip down to to um, the lake or the ocean front there, you were replicating what they would have taken the empty barrels from here to markets. Yes. And then the apples would have been loaded in in Annapolis Royal and perhaps shipped to Europe. Yes. That's exactly um, right. Or, yeah. or the colonies in the Americas probably yeah, purchased they, a lot of them. They used, to they used to fill some of those barrels very similar to this with fish, salted fish, gas barrel, and, and ship it all over. Anything dry? Anything dry, yeah. Nails in the smaller barrels? That's right. You'd fill them up, Nail sell them by the pound? Yeah. And so this plant, this plant wouldn't be, or factory wouldn't be set up for, um, for making watertight barrels? No. It's a whole different thing using different woods, old exactly, oaks yeah. and things yeah. that'll swell. And yeah, the wood for for uh, dry barrel or wet barrels is usually thicker, different type of wood also. Where these these were like these barrels were the apple box of the or the uh, cardboard box of the time. Yeah. So that's what it was. That's what they were used for. One trip overseas, the apples were taken out and the barrels were disassembled, disassembled and burnt or whatever. So essentially this is the manufacturing shot for the bits. Now we're going to go down and see the exactly. manufacturing or the assembly plant for yeah. the finished barrels. Exactly. Which we call the cooperage. The cooperage. Head down there. So this is the cooperage. This is our cooperage. And this is the one we moved with oxen. Yeah, 10 teams of oxen moved this 1,600 feet. And how, how much do you think it weighed? I think it weighs between eight and 10 tons. Holy mackerel. We put it on two logs and drug her here. <laughs> you didn't move rollers underneath it or anything? We had Just short things? rollers, yeah. Did you? Once we get on solid Which, ground. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's see how you make barrels. <laughs> Well, this is a fascinating shot, Barry. Fascinating indeed. So I'm just curious, was, was there certain seasons that different aspects of barrel making was done? That's right, there is. Um, you, you would cut all your timber for your barrel stock in the winter, 
get it to the mill for spring breakup when you had lots of water, so you power your mills. They would saw all your staves and your heads, and then you would take that home and, and usually pile it outside your cooperage. And then in late summer, early fall, you started assembling your barrels. And these barrels were all a certain size. This is a three bushel barrel. Okay. So you had inspectors come around that would measure the, the circumference of the bilge, and it had to be within a certain size. Was that to ensure that you weren't, as a let's say, a, a for lack of a better word, a retailer, that you weren't selling less than what the barrel was supposed to hold? Yes. Yeah. Quality control. Quality control. That's because crazy. prior to a lot of cooperages, they were using barrels that were used for prior use. A lot of flower barrels were used for right. this. So they would vary, every cooper maybe would vary his barrel a little. Yeah. So once they had a set standard, I think it was in the 1800s, they had the set standard, then they were all made the same. So it, fa it fascinates me that they they took advantage of everything yeah. possible, sure. right? So yeah. snow on the ground for skidding the logs with the horses in the winter. Yep. High water to power the mill that makes the staves and, yep. the, and the bits. And then at your leisure, I guess, when you've got time and you don't have to be gardener or focusing on food production or hunting, you could yeah. start putting the barrels together. There was, there was hundreds of these cooperages around this area. We're 26 miles from the Annapolis Valley. All surrounding the Annapolis Valley was coopers. You had every little shed roof had a cooper cooperage set up. Yeah, interesting. So let's go through the process, Barry. Show me All right. how you build one of these guys. So what we do is we have a raising tub. In that tub is a ring, and that ring determines the size of our barrel to an extent, I guess. We fill the ring with staves. So normally what we use is, is uh, 15 or 16 staves. So what you do is you stand them around inside your your raising tub. So you alternate your wide ones and your narrow ones, because if you don't, you'll end up with flat-sided barrels. Oh, I suppose, eh? And are these uniform, narrow and wide, or are they they vary? They're they're random. They're random. So you might have to, when you get down to the last one, you might have to fiddle around to get the piece exactly just, just right to fit them. Yep, you fit the last one. I'm sorry, what do you call this again? The standing? It's a raising tub. A raising tub. Yeah. Prior to this, prior to this tub, they would use a, a catch hoop. So you just stand that on, lean that against your stomach and stand your staves into it. Like this. Yeah. Maybe somebody helping. No, no, you no, did it all alone. by yourself. Yeah, all by yourself. Let me see how many I got in this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So I got to get some wider ones here. See, the more, normally it's 15 or 16 staves. If you go 17 staves, you can still fill these rings, but you'll have a bigger build. So when the inspector comes, you may be out two he, inches. You won't like that. No. So you condemn your hoops. He you probably bird. wouldn't like them even if they were bigger than what they're no. advertised. That's he right. wanted consistency. You want some consistency. So what you had to do for your last one is is pick through. Do some sorting. That guy looks close. Okay, we'll try that one. See how good my eye is. Well, he's close. He's close. So this is called the windlass. So what we're doing here is we're going to wrap this around our staves. And windle them up. I'm sorry, what's the term? Windless. Windless them up. Windless them up. There you go. That hoop. Can I have that? You bet. There? These staves, you hear the cracking? I do. They're just they're best a bit on the dry side, so what would what we would do is we'd have a fire in this heater over here, this barrel heater. 
This is a stove that is designed for one use. And that's going to drive the moisture out of it. What it's going to do is we have a lot of tension on these hoops or on these staves when I wound it up. Mm -hmm. So what this is going to do is they have about a 12% moisture content into them. So what it's going to do is heat up the lignum that holds all the fibers together okay. and allow it to slide past each other and we'll take that spring out of it. Very good. So what I'll do is I'll fire this until it's warm, put it back in there, and then it's a lot easier to finish winding it up tight mm -hmm. and then put it back on until I see smoke coming out of here. And what, then, what, uh, just curious, what species of spruce are you harvesting? Red. Red. Yeah. We don't have much red in Ontario. Is that right? White spruce is, is way too naughty. Black spruce, I think, can be used also. Yeah, we have black spruce, but further north in the province. So yeah, yeah we don't a lot of red spruce and, and balsam fir. Okay, exactly. from, the, from the barrel heater, we put it into the barrel jack. And this was developed in Nova Scotia. <laughs> this tool was. It doesn't, doesn't, well, what, it, doesn't surprise me very. It was... Uh, It was built after some of the. I guess it wasn't developed in Nova Scotia. It was built after some of the. Some of the the Coopers went south down through New York and Boston and went Cooper and came back, and then they built. They built this. So what it is is basically a, a barrel vice. Mm -hmm. Prior to this, you had to wrestle that thing up against the bench or something. Yeah, to keep and, it. And this efficient. holds it. This holds yeah. it. And the interesting thing I find about that era today, we go to a store. Back then, they made it. Yeah. And you needed this new ring. We went yeah. over here to the Recross. next building we're going to see next. And you went to the blacksmith shop and said, I want that and I want it this size. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. So what we have is square end. And we need to put a, a angle on it so that we can slide our head into it. Or an end. Yeah. That's what you use this here. This is called a chamfer knife. So you go all the way around your barrel with that. Then you take this tool, which is called a double gear. So you have a flat topping plane on one side yep. and a V-shaped knife on the other. So this is this is called the crows. So what you do first is you go over and you level off all your staves to the right. So the same height. Same height. Flip it over. Make that angle perfect. And then put that crow's, that groove into it right there. And that's what the, what's what your ring, your top's going to sit right into. And that head's locks right in it. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And the heads were all made at the mill. See? They're all rounded. And there's three pieces to a head. Well, they can be two, they can be three, they can be four. Normally, we don't like to go over four because they're a bugger to try to handle when you got four or five pieces here trying to put this in. Mm -hmm. So those just lock right into that. Into that groove. Into that groove, and then you put your, your hoops on. And you've got another, I presume, you've got another plane that you use similar to this device to put uh, to put this taper on here. Yeah, it's it's two saucers, basically. And does it do both sides at the same time? It does. It's, it swings up into it. Two blades. One cuts the top bevel and then it goes into a chipper that puts the other bevel. Puts it on. Interesting. Yeah. And we've got a few finished ones over here, do we, Barry? We yeah. Do the, and then they're wrapped about the wrap. They're wrapped with uh, wooden hoops. This is a piece of maple here. Maple makes the best ones. Is that, so is you that cut them. Silver maple? Uh, it's a red maple. Red maple. Yeah. So what we do is you cut up to about the size of a broom handle and six and a half feet long. You split it on a, on a piece of machinery over there, which is just a, a blade, mm -hmm. and then you shave that down to get a consistent thickness so you, when you bend it, you don't have any flat spots or thick spots. You're using it. a draw knife for yep, that? Yeah, just a draw knife. Yeah. And then Boy. you bundle them up in bundles of a uh, hundred. The guy who made that used one before. That's oh, pretty, pretty some of these Some of these guys could make hundreds of these in a day. Yeah. 
It's like I, I, some of the numbers stagger me. They yeah. say a blacksmith apprentice had to make a thousand nails a day, square yeah. nails a day, and he worked six days a week. <laughs> All right, so he made six thousand nails a week. Average Cooper assembling these barrels would make fifty a day. Fifty a day. Yeah. With the parts already. With like yeah, just the way it is right now. Hoops are made. So you're assembling all these barrels. Yeah. 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 And of course we didn't we can use this because we're not going to make it a wet barrel, we're going to make it a dry barrel. Right, right. And you can you you can make a wet barrel using wooden hoops, but you just have to put so many of them yeah. on. You'd have to instead of two for a barrel, you might have to put five or six. Right. And we can see that well that's we have some different types of barrels that we make. You can have barrels that are watertight but do not hold liquids. How's that work? It's one of these powder barrels. So this powder barrel has to be watertight to keep the moisture out and the powder in. So this is a 1700s British powder keg. Brilliant. So this is this is oak. This is all oak. Yeah. Oak. With uh, birch, maple hoops, and copper. Copper rings. And it's for, for holding black powder? Yep. Well, the um, the oak ones now, are you hand drawing those staves out? Yep. A lot of work. It is, a lot of work. You're not going to make 40 of them an hour. No, no. Well, so that's a, de a replica. You said you made some reproductions also of the French, which are slightly different. Yeah, French is about the same size, except they have all wooden hoops, and the wooden hoops are wrapped with the. Uh, they're wrapped with a. Let's see one here. They're wrapped with a, a will. Hmm. After we made some, we found out that it was a will that was grown in France. Oh, yeah. For wrapping, yeah. so we use. We well, didn't they, have it. And they imported it. Yeah, to, so to build them here. We used uh, spruce wood. Yeah, spruce wood. We, we use that for birch bark to me building. It's amazing stuff. Tough. And once it dries and it shrinks down, it's, yes. it's just like being nailed. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. We have a wigwam that was built by uh, a couple of Mi'kmaq from uh, the Wildcat Reserve, I believe. Uh, father and daughter. The. Um, Interested from my research, there are a lot of turbulent times with European settlers and indigenous peoples, but that didn't happen so much in Nova Scotia with the Mi'kmaq. No, they had no. a more amiable relationship. Yes, yeah. The French, the French were were very friendly, or they were all friendly with the Mi'kmaq at that time. In this area, we got the Lake Lawson, which is part of the Gold River. And the Mi'kmaq would travel up this seasonally for salmon and, and whatnot, and and it was uh, recorded that Mrs. Ross said that they were always welcomed at her door because during a, a rough time period, she found salmon on her doorstep that they left for her. Fascinating. So it was, uh, you know, it was, and they used to go hunting. They would go moose hunting together and yeah. and and deer hunting and that sort of thing. So. It's interesting, just for the shape here. So in the winter time, this would be a, a winter uh, wigwam. In the summertime, often in in the woodland Indians that live around our part of the world, the summer wigwams were dome covered. Okay. And they would they'd leave those frames up, but in the winter time, they'd have to disperse from their big groups. It couldn't sustain them, and they'd go into small hunting groups, and they'd often take the bark off, leave the dome wigwam up go to their hunting grounds with maybe two or three families, and then they'd build a conical shaped one because it would shed more snow right. and a better thermal effect for heat inside. But this, it looks like they built this one pretty sturdy. <laughs> yes, this is sturdy. I checked it this winter and all the snowstorms and the winds we had, and there was still bare ground inside. And it's the real McCoy. It's all sewn together with root. Yep, all spruce root. Very nice, very nice. Okay. So now we can go to the blacksmith shop. All right. Okay, so now we're talking my true passion here, Barry, because I, I got a blacksmith shop at home and we're in the process of actually trying to recreate a 17th century one with stone forge and bellows and such. But right. 
but this intrigues me. So maybe we can start with the. I, I shoot a lot of horses when we, back when we had Canadians, but I've I've never shoot an oxen. Yeah, that's uh, this is this is an ox sling, and it is designed to support the ox. An ox's anatomy is such that it doesn't really like to stand on three legs for any length of time. So what this does is it's is you walk you unhook it and you you pull the sling to the one side. You walk your ox right up those steps and he comes in, you pull this up underneath him. And then you you windless you can windless your your sling up so that it's it's uh just snug up against his belly. He's not, you're not lift, trying to lift him off no. the ground. You need some heavier stuff. Yes, yeah. You get some oxen in here that's close to a ton. And you just support them because I've seen oxen in here that will just lay with all four just like this. They're just laying just into relax that. And, yeah, and yeah. others just fight it constantly. And this place is just creaking and rocking. I can imagine. So you uh, you support them and then you, you pull... If you're doing the front foot, you pull your front foot up and you strap them in here so it's setting like this. You get a, I got a hoof here that I can show you. So what you'd have is you'd have his his hoof tipped up like this, and this would go around as hold the ankle, there. hold the ankle there, so you can work on it. So what you do is you you cut all the bottom off here. Mm -hmm. Similar to what you do with a horse, you nip her and file. Yeah, you nip her and file, and then you nail the shoe on. And the ox has a two-piece shoe, split hoof, because it has a split hoof, and you have a lot less room for error on an ox than you do with a horse. Oh, do you ever? You it's only got thin the wall. Is it? Yeah, the wall is very thin. The horse can be fairly forgiving, but and an ox, if you get close, will get lame. You don't have to get in. You don't have to draw blood, but if you get close, they can be lame. So do you, you, you're you making these in the blacksmith shop here? Yep, the these, shoes? these are a winter shoe and this is a front shoe. And and um, you were mentioning, so this isn't just for your oxen on the farm. You have people that have ox teams all over the province that bring their ox here to be shod. That's right. We used to shoe... That's crazy. We used to shoe 60 team at one time. Wow. That's amazing. So the thing that fascinates me about blacksmithing shops is that the blacksmith back in the era we portray, certainly in the era that you do, was probably the most essential person in the homestead. That's right. Yeah. I mean, everything they use from uh, casting, things like pans and stuff. So you've got an array of things here that, that you, your artisans here build. And maybe you could talk a bit about that. The, uh, yeah, the blacksmith was, was a very important trade and a very important person in in the community especially around rural Nova Scotia because most in this end of the province most of the work was done with oxen so he spent a lot of time building ox shoes and you have you know you're showing if you're showing 60 pair a year you got to have a lot of shoes and every foot's a different size yeah so he has to be just same as a horse when you're Shaping the shoe for a horse, he has to build these these shoes for each specific team. That's right. These are all front shoes. There's the back one. Some bigger corks. What happens? See the uh, front shoe. Let's get one that's the right side. On a front shoe, your toenail is behind your cork. On a back shoe, it's in front of the cork. So if you're getting into deep snow. Quite often, what will happen is this will hit before the cork hits. Oh, so they're not, so they're, 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 not they're not tearing it off or cutting themselves as much. Yeah. So the back the back shoe the toenail is always ahead. So we saw some footage of a of a reenactment that the Ross Farm participated in, or I guess orchestrated the whole thing, and on um, on the new Ross Freighters. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Barry. The, uh, it was it was for the 250th anniversary of Chester Basin, which is about 12 miles from here. But it was a common in this area 250 years ago to freight barrels and lumber out put on the boats to be moved around the coast. So they used to refer to the, the teams going out as the New Ross Freighters. So we were part of that reenactment where we loaded up two wagons, 
and we had six or eight or ten teams of oxen, and we leapfrogged from here out to Chester along the highway. So it was it was very interesting. It was you know there's a lot of unknowns as to how well the, the oxen would travel for any length of time on hot asphalt. Yeah, that would be and not something you'd contend yeah, with in the 1800s. Or whether they should be shod or barefoot or that sort of thing. And, and it, it worked out well. I mean, we learned a lot in that day. We could have made that 15 or 12 or 15 miles in one day easily. Easily, classic. Yeah. Hi highlighted your time here. I it suspect. was. It was fun. It was a good... It was. It was stressful, but you know, it all come together, and, you, and when you get the right people in that, and all those Teamsters, yeah. and I still come across them every once in a while, that the, the first thing they say is, is when they see me, you know, we should do that again sometime. <laughs> They'll be talking yeah. about it for decades. They will, yeah. It was <laughs> fun. Sure. Yeah. So, again, I'm assuming we've got a heritage breed here, Barry. We do. These are Cotswool. They were a breed used uh, for the wool. They're very long, eight inch curly wool, which is what the spinners all wanted. Mm -hmm. This this ewe has a set of twins. She had a set of triplets, which is very unusual for this breed to have triplets. And she had triplets last year too. So she's she's yeah. a she's definitely a keeper. And she raised, I mean, a sheep only has two teats, so she raised triplets last year and they, they grew well. They all did well. Yeah. yeah, this one here, we lost one of them when they were born, which wasn't good, but so that you, happens. Do you do the shearing here? As we do, well? yeah. We shear them. We shear them uh, probably in a month's time before they go out on pasture. So there's pretty much nothing you don't do on this farm that they would have had to do in, say, the mid 1800s. Yeah, like you we'll cut do. the hay, you grow yep. the gardens, you preserve the food. You... Yep, we do all that as a demonstration, yeah. yeah. What do we got here, Barry? This is a hay press. Prior to a hay press, you put all your hay in loose, which takes a lot of room. You'd fill, you'd fill up both sides of this barn with loose hay. When you pressed it, you ended up with bales that were that size there, yeah. and it would compact a lot of that hay. Like a modern hay baler. It is, yeah. yeah. I know we experimented when we had our barn with horses. We decided we would restore a hay bind, and I restored the trolley in the top, and we put our hay in loose, and it was pretty romantic. It was a lot of fun until I had to feed it out to yeah. a dozen cows and six horses, and then it wasn't much fun. Yeah, it was a lot of work. I remember as a kid putting in hay, loose hay in these barns with the uh, the double harpoon. Yeah, hay hay for it. Yeah, You'd jump it in, turn it, and then yeah. the horse would go out, and the hay would go up. And the only breath of fresh air you got is when you tripped it and closed yeah. your eyes. Because yeah. <laughs> it was so dusty and it would just feel so cool. Yeah, we did the same. Had a, a third horse outside, two horses bringing in the wagon, a horse outside that would yeah. pull the trolley pull up, up, trip it, pull it over, you trip the rope, dump the hay. Still a lot of those hanging in old barns in this area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So here at the Ross Farm, they, they have helped to bring the Canadian horse back from near extinction. Um, so what was it? It's in uh, 1970, they did a survey of Canadian horses, and they they were down to 400 animals. And so they've been on the threatened species since, um, and still are today. But uh, the Ross Farm is, has uh, kept it alive. We got, well, how many do you have here, Barry? We have four in here and one up on site. So, so and they, another one coming. Oh, you got one in order, that's right. One order, yeah. Coming from coming Ontario. Out, coming out of Ontario, yeah. Well, we farm with them, we use them, and it was a visit down here to visit Kathy's sister that, that planted the seed. And it was an expensive seed, Barry, by the time we were done, but we had a lot of fun with them. We farmed with them, um, cut hay, we brought our firewood in with bobsleds. Uh, I was doing Civil War reenacting, so we trained three of them to shoot firearms off right. their back and do saber charges. And, yeah, it was a great time, but we're, we're out of them now, but I sure miss them. One of the prettiest horses. And the history behind this breed of horse is they they were shipped here in 1665 by King Louis the 14th, yep. the Sun King, and from his royal stables. He ships over um, two, uh, a stallion and 20 mares. And eight of the mares die on the voyage. Yep. And the ones that, that um, 
two years successively, they brought in two more groups, not as big, but they're the horse that ultimately, through selective breeding, created a, a distinctly Canadian horse that, uh, I mean, they're living, breathing parts of the Canadian history. Yeah. They're a little horse of iron, and they proved themselves to that all the many times, many times. What really brought them to, we used them for American Civil War reenacting, and that's what was almost the demise of the species. The Union Army uh, came up here in the early parts of the war, and they, they, they calculate that they took about, they took about um, 30 plus thousand of them down in the States. Most of them died, of course. Yeah. But they're a rugged little horse, and they could pull, and they were, they're, they're easy to train, as we found out. But they could pull quite a bit. And they use them for pulling their cannons and, and, and what have you. Yeah. Six up teams. I've driven them and it's scary as heck. Like it's, <laughs> it's one thing to drive, drive a team on Bob sets where you got yeah. control. But when when uh, we did the Civil War thing with a six up team, you have one rider on each of the left horses. And you steer the horse on the left with your other hand. And you're pulling the cannon and the carriage. Uh, part of it with all the ammunition tons behind you and all the riggings loose instead, instead of having whipple trees and what have you you get all this loose harness and you're going at a full gallop and it's just right <laughs> yeah but yeah i survived a few of those but, and they know. served they served the canadian served in the canadian horse served in all the major world wars yeah the boer war the first world yeah. war second world war they were all infantry horses yeah, and still, is, in my opinion, the prettiest horse in the planet. Yeah. They got that curly mane and that cup in their forehead. And it's yeah. quite a broad smile. Smart. Yeah. Yeah, they're gems.